Okay, so the next thing we're going to study is we're going to go into uh, depth on the real zeros of a polynomial. So we're going to really look at some of the uh, details of how you find them and how you determine what they are, how many they are, how many there are, um, and some other uh, interesting facts about real zeros. Okay, <clears throat> The real zeros are very important because um, they do determine things like the degree of the polynomial, the number of turning points of the polynomial, um, the behavior of the polynomial in between the tails, so where it does all its turning and wobbling, the x-intercepts and the, the real zeros really do uh, give us a lot of insight into the behavior of a polynomial. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to point out is just kind of looking at the idea of division, okay, um, and the, the idea of factors. Uh, so we've talked about the idea that if um, if r is a real zero uh, of f of x, now f of x being a polynomial, then there are some consequences of that. By definition, that means f of r is equal to zero. <clears throat> so if you plug in the real zero, you get zero out. That's why it's called a zero. But also, we found out that um, r comma zero is an x-intercept. And we've also seen, and this is the one that I think is really interesting because it really starts to develop um, you know, some interesting features of polynomials. <laughs> and that is the fact that x minus r is a factor of f of x. Okay, so that's going to be really important. So we're going to hold on to that. Really, all of these are important, um, but I think that one's going to really come into play as we move through our study here. Okay, so now think about this. If you're looking at factors of something, you know, like if you wanted to factor the number 20, you have, you know, 2 and 10, 5 and 4, 1 and 20, um, 40 and 1 half. You don't have to be integers. You could have other things. Um, but factors of a number are two numbers that you multiply together to get it, right? Um, so factors of 20, you know, could be, you know, 4 and 5, for instance. Well, if you knew one of the factors, how would you get the other one? Well, you would have to divide that factor into the 20 to get it. So division is going to be very important here. Factoring and division are very related to each other. Same with polynomials, not just the numbers, okay? Same with polynomials. So if if x minus r is a factor, then that must mean it divides into it evenly, with no remainder, with a remainder of zero, okay? Just like it would with numbers. Now, if you think about the division process with numbers, um, you know, I'll give you an example. If I did, if I wanted to do 3 into 20, right, just very simple, right? So that would be the same as um, looking for what 20 over 3 is equal to. Well, you do 3 into 20, that gives you, what, 6? 3 goes into 26 times, 6 times 3 is 18. Subtract, you get a remainder of 2. And so the result of that, the mixed number that this is equal to, is 6, that's your quotient, and the remainder over the divisor is added on uh, as your um, proper fraction, right? So the mixed number is the sum of the whole number and the proper fraction, or the quotient and the remainder over the divisor. And so, as a general formula, the dividend over the divisor is equal to the quotient, the quotient being the number on top here, um, plus, right, quotient plus the fraction, which is the remainder over the divisor. Okay, so I have an equation now with fractions in it, right? It's the improper fraction equals the whole number plus the proper fraction. Or in the case of polynomials, or as a general formula, the dividend over the divisor equals the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. Okay? That's uh, what we call the division algorithm. All right? This is the division algorithm.
right, so that's our division algorithm. So what's interesting about this equation, you've got two fractions in it, um, and whenever you have fractions in an equation, you can eliminate them simply by multiplying by the LCD. Well, in this case, there's only one denominator, the divisor. And so if you think about multiplying both sides of this equation by the divisor, I'm going to go ahead and do that. The result is interesting. Multiply by the divisor here, multiply by the divisor here, and of course I'm distributing on the right to both of the terms, the quotient and the fraction here. So I'm going to multiply this term by the divisor. So all three terms get multiplied by the divisor. Well, the two terms that already have the divisor in their denominator, those cancel out, right? So the divisor here with the divisor here, those cancel. Here the divisor and the divisor cancel. And so what we have left is simply the dividend is equal to the product of the quotient times the divisor plus just the remainder. You might say, well, why is that important? Well, first of all, let me show you with a numerical example how that works. If you think about um, this example, 20 over 3 equals 6 plus 2 over 3. If I multiply both sides by the 3, which is essentially what we did here, right, multiply by 3, multiply by 3, multiply by 3, the 3's cancel, 3's cancel, and you're left with 20 equals 6 times 3 plus 2. Well, that works out, right? 6 times 3 is 18, plus 2 gives me 20. I'm not dealing with any fractions now. So we have a version of the division algorithm that doesn't require any fractions. There's no actual division there, okay? Um, what's interesting then is that in order for the divisor the number on the bottom, to be a factor of the dividend, right, to be a factor of the dividend, the remainder would have to be zero. If the remainder is zero, then the dividend is just the quotient times the divisor, and these two things are then the factors of the dividend, okay? Um, which makes sense, too. Like, if you had, with numbers, uh, if you had, you know, four goes into 20 five times, with a remainder of zero. So that just means 20 is equal to four times five, quotient times divisor, uh, all the way around. That doesn't matter, they're commutative. But to be consistent, quotient would be five, divisor would be four, add in the remainder of zero, and you get your, um, you get your division algorithm for, um, for the numbers 24 and five, okay? Okay, so now, how does this all play into polynomials? Well, if you think about the divisor, right? <clears throat> We've seen the divisor as a factor. If we want the divisor to be a factor, it would be in the form x minus r. Okay, so think about that. So we were looking uh, before at long division and synthetic division. Um, we've looked at some of the details of long division, synthetic division, how that works. And we looked at x minus c uh, as our divisor, okay? So, let me get rid of some of this. If you have a polynomial, we're going to call it, um, let's call it p of x, or actually let's call it f of x, sorry. Our polynomial is f of x, and I'm going to divide it by g of x, that's our divisor, so dividend over divisor. Okay, so I know that that's going to equal the quotient, we're going to, I'm sorry, the quotient, we're going to call that q of x, plus the remainder, I'll call that r of x over the divisor, again, g of x. All right, so I'm just going to give function uh, names to all these things, but they're all really just polynomials. The remainder usually is going to be a constant, but it could actually be a polynomial as well. Um, Okay, so if I were to multiply both sides by the g of x, which is our divisor, I can go through that process. I won't. I'll just give you the formula. It would be f of x equals q of x 
times g of x plus r of x, okay? Quotient times divisor plus remainder. Now what's interesting, if g of x is in this form of x minus c, because that's how we were looking at our divisors before. So we have a divisor is going to be g of x equals x minus c, okay? If that's the form of our divisor, then you could plug in, um, plug that in for your g of x. So f of x equals q of x times x minus c plus r of x, okay? And so now, if I plug in the value of c to this equation, right? So now think about this, f of, I'll put the c in red here, f of c is going to be q of c, whatever the quotient is, evaluated at c, multiplied by c minus c, right, I'm plugging in for x to c, plus r of c, all right? So when I evaluate this, notice that c minus c is zero. This factor here is zero, and if this factor is zero, zero times anything is zero, so this entire term drops out. And so f of c, if I plug in the c value, is going to be the remainder evaluated at c. Well, assuming your remainder is constant, then the function value at c is going to be your remainder, okay? If your remainder is not constant but another polynomial, then you have to plug in the c to that remainder. Um, so why is that interesting? Well, if I have a polynomial, I'll give you an example. Let's say our polynomial is um, x squared plus 5x plus uh, 4, and I want to divide that by x minus 3, all right? I can find the remainder. One way is to use synthetic division, right? I could use synthetic division. I could take the 3 on the outside, opposite sign, take my coefficients from the top, and then just work through synthetic division, right? Bring down the one, multiply down, uh, that's three, add down, you get an eight, multiply again, you get 24, add down, you get 28. The remainder's 28, right? You could also find the remainder another way, by simply plugging the C, the three, into the original function. So let's look at that. If I were to plug three into the original function, in theory, I should get 28. Let's check it out. 3 squared is 9. 5 times 3 is 15. And 4, 9 and 15 is 24. Add the 4 and I get 28. It's almost magical, right? The remainder that you get when dividing by x minus c is equivalent to the function value at c. Very cool.